Welcome back to Heroes Next Door. Thank you all for joining us for this series at Phoenixville Fire Department in Chester County, PA. Today we're going to be talking to Tower Direct and talking about their critical care unit and their ambulance. So let's go see what they have. So we're meeting back up with Brad Cosgrove. If you remember, he's the chief of Tower Direct, and he's going to walk us through these two units. Good hey, Mike. To, good to see you again. You too. All right. I'm so excited to see these trucks because this is fairly new for here in Chester County and really Pennsylvania, isn't it? Yeah. Um, we're really excited to kind of show off this new technology we're using and kind of reinventing the wheel a little bit. And yeah, come on, I'll show you. All right. Awesome. So what are we going to be looking at first? So the first truck we're going to look at is our critical care team uh, responder unit. Okay. And um, what this is, is one of our pre-hospital critical care nurses is able to respond in the field and meet one of our ambulances to do both 911 calls and inter-facility. Basically, kind of what you would see in the past in a helicopter, we're now doing on the ground. Okay, okay. So, so it's basically a QRS unit for yeah. helping the ambulance services out. Yeah, and we're able to provide a higher level of care and still have all the services that you would have on an ALS unit, plus some. So I'll show you around and we can look at all the different stuff we have. Awesome. Care. Let's start at the driver's side and we'll walk our way around. All right. So some of the things that are a little bit different about this, it's just like predominantly what we see in today's world of a, a chief's vehicle or a medic unit would be, you know, lights and sirens package. Um, but some things that make it a little bit unique is it has its own HVAC system. So we're able to climate control all the additional medications and uh, the blood that we carry, um, which were the first in the area to do on a ground truck. So we're really excited That's about That's always been a challenge. Even back when I was working the chase car and the QRS units, yep. it was very difficult to have that controlled unit. Sometimes we parked outside, sometimes we parked in the garage. Yep. And you know we were very cognizant of our medications because they can expire or not work as well right. if they get too hot or too cold. Yep. So having an HVAC system is pretty cool to see on a truck. It's really cool, and it was actually really easy to install. And um, you know our mechanics were able to do it in house, and it just plugs into your regular household outlet, and it keeps the unit cold, warm, whatever it needs to. So any time of year, the unit can be outside, inside, and uh, it makes sure everything meets its efficacy for temperature. It's definitely gonna help you save money on those expired medications, then. <laughs> Especially with all the meds we're carrying, that I'll show you in a minute. Yeah. All right. So inside, what do you got up front? This is a standard standard expedition. It has lights and sirens, uh, radios for two of our counties, both Chester County. County and Berks County. Um, the unit's predominantly based out of Berks County at our uh, you know, flagship hospital, Reading Hospital, but it's able to go to any of our 911 units, uh, both in Tower Direct and in the community. So if you're working for a different company, it's still a requestable unit, um, just because we wanted to share this opportunity with all the community. Right. It's almost like a rescue task force add-on because you know we have different things throughout yeah. Chester County. We we have the rope rescue, we have collapse right. rescue. If I need that extra resource, I call for it. Right. That's what this is, truck is kind of designed to do. Correct. Correct. Exactly. And we actually are working with the rescue task force to bring the same level of care for these extended extrications and everything else, and just really be a team player and you know work with everyone to get the care out there. Is this then up 24-7? This is a 24-7 unit, yeah, and we actually have uh, a second unit that we can put up as well so we can have a second unit up to um, you know augment or, or additional resources if one of them's tied up. Okay. Do you run single provider or do you have multiple providers in this truck? So this is a single pre-hospital nurse that's trained to critical care as well. So they have um, you know EMS experience as well as ICU experience. Um, so they're able to do the interfacility work, and then this kind of just organically grew to do the 911 responses um, with our medical director, who we'll introduce here in a little bit, and uh, just the progressive thinking of uh, our CCT manager and our team. It, it kind of worked. This is awesome. Yeah. What's in the back seat? Uh, back seat's kind of just storage. Um, nothing really crazy back here. You know, just some organizers, some extra equipment. Um, it has everything from a licensure standpoint that it's licensed to. Uh, meet all the Department of Health regulations, our oxygen bags. Um, because if you think about it, you know, when you worked on the medic unit, when we used to work together, we're not always gonna have, we're gonna usually have another crew there that has equipment there. So while we keep everything for licensure, we keep stuff we don't predominantly use in the back seat. Right. And uh, we're really just bringing the higher level equipment. Yeah, yeah. It's very rare that the QRS or a response vehicle shows up on the scene first. You're gonna have that VLS or even ALS support right. that's gonna bring the heavy sets of gear. but. 
who knows, you may end up there first. It's happened before, so we, yeah, we make sure it's all there and we standardize it with the rest of our equipment so our providers are familiar with the setup so it's not like they're learning a new setup. Right, right. And I know here in Pennsylvania, we have a couple different things that are required for licensure. You have to carry your DOT uh, hazmat book, you yep. have to carry some of your protocols and that kind of stuff. So that's a good place to kind of store that out. Exactly, yeah, and we actually did everything digitized now. So we put it all on our iPad. So okay. every unit has an iPad just to keep it a little bit cleaner and that way you're not worried about finding them or, you know, we were joking yesterday about map books, right. something that it's kind of gone by the wayside, but it's I think now off the license really fine. Right. Okay. So here's and in the back is the business end, right? Yeah. Here's the business end, kind of the meat and potatoes of the uh, of the setup, and it's really broken down into a couple of different things. Um, so we predominantly use the LifePak monitors, but we in the uh, critical care world use these Zoll monitors. Um, they're just a little bit more compact, um, and they have some more capabilities to do more invasive blood pressures and things of that nature. Right, right. Um, so, and then the the thing that's probably the most exciting is this blue cooler here, and this cooler carries two units of whole blood. Okay. And what I mean by that is blood, when you usually see a transfusion given in the, in, in the hospital or in the field, it's usually given in uh, types of components like packed red cells or platelets or fresh frozen plasma. But all the new literature is showing that the one-for-one -one replacement of whole blood is actually the best modality of, of treatment and therapy because you're getting everything that you, you need. Okay. Um, so this was an 18-month project to get underway and, and get on the streets, and it's been on the streets now for about eight weeks. Okay. And we've already had three administrations of it. That's awesome. Yeah. So the question I have, though, is, you know, I'm a different blood type than my wife versus yep. something like that. Yeah. How does that relate? Do you have to cross and type like we do in a hospital? So actually, our blood bank and our hospital staff um, and then Miller Keystone Blood Bank, who we use as our supplier, um, um, that's all been worked out and we use universal donor blood. So it's O positive, so it can be given to anyone. Okay. So there are universal types that we can give and still, you know, make sure we're not gonna have transfusion reactions. I actually got a little bit of an education that in trauma situations uh, or, hemor you know, hemorrhagic situations, it's about a 99% plus compatibility. So those things aren't as big of an issue as we were taught back in the day. Right, right. Dude, that's absolutely life-saving. I had a patient uh, a couple weeks ago that, you know, yeah. had a, a major hemorrhage that I, you know, we put the tourniquets on, we do what we can yep. pre-hospitally uh, to stop that bleeding and fluid replacement, you know, but using either lactated ringers or normal sure. saline, we're kind of more diluting what's going on. Yeah. Having some, you know, whole blood is really going to be a lifesaver for many of these hemorrhages that we come across. And yeah, absolutely. And again, it, it was an education. So. They keep the blood bank, has to keep the records for 10 years, which I never knew. Yep. Um, ton of red tape surrounding it. And just really, we wanted to make sure that we were doing it the right, because, right way, because ultimately, you know, there's a national shortage for blood and we don't want to waste any. Right. So there's actually two sets of parameters they use for blood uh, in terms of transport versus um, if they never left the blood bank in a storage. So these coolers are actually um, set for storage. So it's a very tight temperature parameter set that it's like the blood never left the blood bank. Okay. So every 24 hours, our crews switch out and they get a new cooler. Um, and then they're actually validated for 48. So we do have some stop gaps in place that way we never over shoot, you know, our timeouts and everything else, right. as well as each unit has its own thermometer and an RFID chip on it okay. to make sure that it stays temperature controlled. And Perfect. Zero waste. Now you have a ton of equipment in here. Can we pull some of this out and take, yeah. take a look at it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, right. So we'll pull the blood out. Put it on the table. We'll kind of set everything up at once. Okay. Set this over here. Yeah. Um, and then, do you want to go over the monitor? Or it's uh, the Zoles we're pretty familiar okay. with. Uh, we there's a couple different monitors out there. You yep. have the Phillips monitor, which we actually did a video of uh, Southern, Chester, that. Southern yep. Chester County. Uh, John Ryan walks us through that, talks, takes a look at that. That's awesome. If you guys haven't seen that video, go back and check that out. It's a really good video. They talk about their medic unit. Uh, we have Zoles. We have um, the Life Pack. So yep. I think we're good with the monitor. All right, cool. We'll show you kind of the fun stuff and a little bit of the different stuff. So let's start with the blood since we were just talking about it. Um, so these coolers are actually, again, um, pretty expensive, but it, it's pretty simple design. They're nice and lightweight. They're portable. And these coolers actually work in the hospital as well. It's how they transport blood from floor to floor. Okay. So we actually reworked the entire process. Right. So... It reminds uh, me of the TV shows where they used to uh, do organ donations, where they put it in the you know the yeah. little red cooler box yeah. and they you know take it from place the to old, place. Yeah, exactly. And those the old lunchbox style coolers was what we were using until this, and then we kind of did some research and found out there's better stuff out there. And, That's awesome. Uh, yeah. 
So, all right, so in here. So in here, it's really just a, a cooler. And obviously all these different verifications and just, you know, for everyone watching at home, these are two expired units. So we actually keep this sealed so we don't lose any of the efficacy of the, uh, you know, temperature regulation. Right. There's usually extra ice packs topped on here, but. Okay, um, okay. And what's this made out of? Do you know? It's just a high density foam wrapped in. Okay, uh, so like it's a, not dry ice or anything like no, that? No, and they're just cooler packs that we freeze and just rotate out every day. So okay. it just really holds its temperature. And when we were going through the pilot of this and, and making sure this was going to be, a, you know, a viable project, we actually did temperature validation with expired blood that we checked times and saw how long the duration it could stay out in different, you know, temperatures, inclement weathers, because it's not always the hot you're worried about. It can also get too cold. Right. And obviously, Pennsylvania, we got all four seasons. So we want to make sure it wasn't freezing as well as it wasn't boiling. Um, you know, it's... Uh, don't quote me, but I think it's one to five degrees cel uh, Celsius that it has to stay. It's very tight okay. yeah. uh, parameters for the storage. Absolutely, I love this. I'm glad you guys were able to do this. Um, do you know of any other unit within Pennsylvania? There might be some out in the United States that are doing blood products like this on a ground unit, but I don't think there is any in Pennsylvania I, that I know of. Not that doesn't have a physician involvement. So I think this is one of the big things that, um, you know, a lot of, again, legwork went into the regulatory aspect of it and making sure we were within, uh, kind of in the rules of engagement, sure. if you will, yeah. um, for us using critical care nurses. Um, so not that I'm aware of, there are some of the flight services that do it, but, you know, uh, again, we don't have some limitations with weight and the weather parameters, you know, it's an SUV, it can go pretty much anywhere, anytime. Yeah. Well, I'll be calling you because I know I've had a couple of patients within the last year that uh, definitely we'll be ready for you. Time. So, all right. So, what other what else you got over here? So, um, we'll kind of go to the ventilator next. So, these are Hamilton T1 ventilators. Okay. Um, and this is essentially the same vent you would have in an ICU. Wow. Um, so, again, readiness, preparedness. One of the big things we do is the the crews keep these ready to roll, so they literally need to turn it on and do their settings, and and off they go. It already has the end title on the circuit, so they can hook it right up to their monitor. Doesn't matter the monitor, it's a universal connector. Now, why would you have to use a monitor that an ICU would use versus, you know, I have an auto vent. I set rate, I set volume, and right. you know, I, I set very basic settings in a pre-hospital uh, environment. Why would I need this versus something else? Well, again, the entire reason this unit was created was to help move patients throughout our health system. Um, and a lot of those patients are pretty sick. Uh, you know, we just are kind of getting back on our feet after COVID, which was a ton of sick respiratory patients that, had very tight vent settings and had a lot of different um, uh, settings that something like an auto vent or you know some of the smaller ventilators that we used to grow up on wouldn't have the parameters and the sensitivities okay. that a vent so, like this so has. you can run the fio two differently you can set peep differently you can set the inspiratory versus expiratory rate differently absolutely those kind of settings that you have to really fine tune a critical care patient yep. you have the ability to do that versus the vent that i use which is you know basically a BVM. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Manual yeah. BVM. Yeah. So I think next kind of is our you know, primary bag we utilize and we can maybe move the blood out of the way for the next one too. Okay. But with us doing that, I was going to bring in our medical director, Bert Schiffer. Okay. Um, I know Bert very well. Good to see you like again. How are you doing, Doc? Thanks for doing this with us. Yeah, yeah. Fun. I appreciate you guys inviting me out. Uh, there's a lot of education to be had here. So, you know, I, I appreciate you uh, opening your doors and showing us what you got. Absolutely. Glad to have you. So, uh, Brad's already talked us through, you know, the blood products, the vent, that kind of stuff. But you've got a couple of pretty large bags here. We can do. You, can you walk me through what you have? Absolutely. I'm going to let um, you step inside so, here. So what we have here is this is our primary bag. And what we do is we try to have this bag set up for anything that we're going to need for pretty much any response on a normal standpoint whether that be a pre-hospital response as an ALS squad, or if we're going to a hospital for most of our transports. And it's, it's just set up as, as any EMS bag would be, is we try to set up different concepts together. Um, so you have an airway kit in here, you have medications we do. in here, we do. you have IV start kits, Absolutely. all that kind of stuff. Okay. And then we have redundant equipment as well. So in the top, what we have is a, is a second vent tubing set because without the, the vent tubing, which is the disposable piece, we can't use it. So we have that all here yeah. in case there's a problem because, well, we all know that problems exist. Um, the next thing we have down here is essentially what our emergency response to back up one of our medic units would be. We have an intubation kit here. And with that, we have our, our endotracheal tubes, 
and we have our McGrath uh, laryngoscope. Right, so having video scope is very important nowadays Absolutely. too. It makes it so much easier to visualize those cords, make sure that you're in and you're not missing those. Tubes. Every single time, and what we really like to do is we really like this device because it allows our, uh, our more experienced or older like myself providers that like to directly look in and still have the ability to do that. And this device gives all of our people the ability to be as good as they can be to provide the best care they can to the community. Right. Now I've used that in the past and my partners actually kind of look over my shoulder and they're Absolutely. confirming that with me rather than just me going in by myself. You know, yeah, I know what I'm doing, but having another provider behind me to actually look at the screen. Absolutely. It's good. Gives, good you little, gives you a little bit of help. Have, having that support across the team so that everybody knows what everybody's doing, it, you just can't beat that. Yeah. And it's um, so small. I remember the old roles that we used to have back in the day. So that's one of the other things that we've done as a system is that we've tried to look at systems designed for equipment so that people can take equipment and care for all of their patients with less equipment that's better thought out. Yeah. Instead of having 40 choices, we try to limit the choices so that people go in a single direction that is patient-centered and gives the best outcome possible. Right. And it's easier on my back for carrying oh my gosh. stuff around. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons we broke this up into different bags for primary and secondary. Okay. Um, the other thing we have is we have orogastric tubes in here because what we found is that anybody that gets an endotracheal tube, making sure that they don't have uh, regurgitation really make sure that it's safer for the patient when they're intubated. Yeah, one of the standards that I do anytime I intubate a patient, especially if the BLS has arrived on scene first or the cops got there, maybe they ventilated beforehand, they're gonna get a little that gastric Absolutely. distension, I always drop an NG too. That's the smartest thing to do. Or an smartest thing to do. Yep. Um, and then the other thing we have here is we have our, our narcotics. Um, we find that, especially with some of the longer transport times that we have, we end up needing to sedate the patient with a lot of medications and we have those all in here. We have our paralytics in here, our sedatives in here, and what we do want to do is that we make sure that our patients are as comfortable as they can be as we move between our facilities. Yeah, so, it's all about the comfort. And absolutely. the more comfortable they are, the better vital signs they get. Absolutely. <laughs> so you need less vent settings, you need less, less blood pressure medicines. If you can keep the patient comfortable, they end up doing so much better. Right, right. And that's lockable. So, you know, yeah, you just can't locked get into that. And you we have always to have keep that locked. That's awesome. And it's in a locked vehicle. Okay. So, so we keep to make sure that we make sure that all the regulations are checked. Yep. As well as the patients are well cared for. Absolutely. All right, so what we'll do is we'll go inside the bag and we'll see all the, all the other things we have. There's a lot here. Yeah, I like that it's modular too. You know, we used to have the old uh, lunch boxes or yeah. the tackle boxes that you <laughs> yeah, used to have. Yeah. And when they and, fell over. And, and, <laughs> you lost everything. So if this falls over in the back of the ambulance, because you guys are supporting other ambulance services. Absolutely. Yeah, and we've, we've really come to realize that if we compartmentalize what we're doing, it helps us think through what do I need, when do I need it, and how do I use it? Awesome, okay, talk me through it. So at the top, we've got kind of our trauma area. We've got tourniquets, um, big needles to decompress somebody's chest in case you get a pneumothorax yep. or air in their chest, chest seals. And we used all that in order to make sure that, that we have one direction to go. We keep scissors in there, uh, hemostats, all that stuff you're gonna need in case there's a bad trauma. Okay. Uh, below that is our 3% saline. We keep that completely separate from everything else and secondarily sealed okay. because that's about patient safety. That's okay. to make sure that nobody gets confused about which which saline they're gonna grab. Okay. Why do you have a different si percent of their saline? What, so, what difference does that make? So this has to do with usually neurologically injured patients. So somebody that has a, a head bleed or something like that, that we need to make sure that that they they have the best chance for a good survival, and there's good good stat, good information that uh, talks about how that is right. beneficial. Normally, we you have lactated ringers or nine percent. You're dropping that down to three percent. So what we're doing is it's not so much about getting fluid; it's about getting that as a medication. Right. And that's the difference. Awesome. Um, next down here, we have um, we have a special kind of IV that actually starts a small gauge IV and it actually gets, makes it a bigger IV. Okay. So you can take a 20 gauge IV and you can make it into a 14. Right, okay. So we have two kits for that in case somebody that doesn't have good vasculature because they're in hemorrhagic shock or right. something like that, that we're able to get them better vasculature access so right. we can give them more fluid. It's almost like the old trocars we used to use for the trachea, so where you put yeah. it in, introduce it, take it out. Make it exactly. Bigger. That's Same awesome. Yeah. Um, and we also have a teapot in here. Okay. And the reason we keep the teapot in with this equipment is that not all of the the ambulance services that we go to have a pelvic binder. Right. So we want to make sure that we provide the best care we can for people when we're moving between them. Again, this is stuff that we don't have on the ambulance. We have things to, to take care of these, right. but these are very specifically upgradable 
um, yes. resources that I just can't carry. I just don't have the money to carry, you know, 9% saline plus 3% plus this sure. plus that. And, and the 3% is out, out of the paramedic scope of practice, but with online medical command, with the ability to have direct physician, nurse, and patient communication, we're able to expand those capabilities. That's awesome. Um, and the other part is that we've had tremendous health system support to ensure that we have the care available at the roadside because that's where the patients are. Absolutely. Um, just kind of going around, one of the other things that everybody worries about is how do you store your bougie? Yeah. Because everybody wants to get it, use it. Wind it up. And what we yeah. found is that this, this bag specifically has a channel. Okay. So that we have it available and it's not it's not in a tight little roll. Right, right. Because nothing like trying to go in a straight line when it's going to loop loops on the way. Exactly. Um, next thing we have, we have our pumps. Um, obviously as a critical care truck, we want to make sure that we can have the ability to, to exactly manage patients. So we keep ah, wow. four pumps here. Okay. Um, all of our ambulances are gonna be having a pump so that we that gives at least the our systems ambulances five pumps when it comes to a critical care That's patient. perfect. I remember back when we were flying on Sky Flight Care out of Brandywine. What a wonderful we had, Yeah, we had the uh, you know, the IVAC triple chambers. Yes. Good. And there's many times where we have all three of those running and the needed another one. So. Yep. so we figure four is a good starting place yep. Yep. and our system already has additional redundancy. Awesome. Um, and then we're able to use both um, syringe pump components as well as standard drip. Okay. So it gives for us our viewers, what brand do you guys choose for this one? So these are the Sapphire pumps. Okay. And we're using that because we found that it's easy. We can put a library in it. It's easily controllable, and it's actually used extensively across the critical care interfacility. Yeah, program. a lot of the 911 services here in Chester County are going to the Sapphire they pumps are. too. They so are. it's compatible. So when I call you in, and maybe I've already started my own pump. We can we, keep we working can keep going. That's awesome. And, and that interoperability is a major piece of what we do. We try to take anything that we do with critical care and we try to to expand that through our entire system so that everybody has the same expectations. Right, right. Well, and then the one thing too with some of our stroke patients where we're giving something like a medication that needs to be continued and it's time sensitive like TPA or some of the other blood pressure control medicines is to not delay care. We've actually worked within our hospital system yes. to have those medications continue right to the CAT scanner. So it's again, it's all about patient care. It's all about, you know, time is tissue and the continuation of therapy that because we're part of the system, it's seamless. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, you got a big yellow one? Got a big yellow one. And, <laughs> and, and here, here's a lot of the, the fun stuff. So these are all the drugs. Okay. Um, and having flown before, you're, you're familiar with oh, yeah. all, all the stuff that we have. So we have all kinds of different medications for electrolytes and, um, blood pressure control, whether we need to go up or go down, just regulating all the parameters. Um, beyond that, we've also got uh, normal saline, we've got albuterol, we've got propofol, we've got just standard glucose, just yeah. you get a diabetic. Sometimes all you need to do is give them some sugar and we, we've got the ability to do right. that. Right. So this is pretty much set up to do everything that an emergency room can do in that critical care aspect for 15 to 20 minutes to get them to the next service. Oh, we even plan further than that. So we, we look at this truck as a two hour truck. Okay. So this is a, gives us the ability to take care of any patient that, would, that you'd take care of on a helicopter for say 15 or 20 minutes. That same patient might need that same transport, but it's snowing outside. Right. So we wanna make sure that this truck in conjunction with an ALS ambulance is able to provide that, that critical care level of care for the entirety of the transport, whether that's 15 minutes or two hours. Right. And we've tried to, to take all of our equipment and ensure that something won't run out, that will, the patient will be comfortable, that they'll have all the blood pressure parameters and respiratory parameters met right. for their entirety of their inner facility transport. Right. The other thing that I noticed is, you know, EMS has kind of changed over the years. We're now to the point after the uh, study that came out of Pittsburgh to kind of treat on the X, Absolutely. stabilize before we transport. Many times, you know, we pick them up and go to the hospital, right. but Grab the end go. result was done. Having a service like this supplement even an ALS service, we can really treat on the X, stabilize that patient, and then get them going from there. Yes, and, and that's what we found is that uh, the initiation of care at the ALS level, and then when we bring in a more experienced critical care nurse, that it's that, we've, we've all been there. We love being, the, who doesn't want to be the second person in for a really sick patient where you come in and you're slower and you're methodical and you bring your expertise. Yeah. And that's, that's what we're looking at is, is in our service area, we've been able to do that with these guys. They come in, they're very experienced. And if something is needed beyond that, we can, we have online medical command 24 hours a day to ensure that 
our patients get the very best care. That's just absolutely beautiful. I appreciate that. Absolutely. So now this is pretty much what's in this truck. Yep. You have a ton more stuff, yep. but you also have an ambulance that runs out of Phoenixville here too. Correct. Do. do you mind if we take a look at that? Absolutely. Please. All right, let's go take a look at that. All right, cool. So you are part of a Tower Health system, right? You yes. are Tower Direct, but Correct. Tower Health is Reading uh, uh, Hospital. How many ambulances do you actually have? Well, and we also have Phoenixville Hospital and Pottstown Hospital. Okay. Um, so we have 18 ambulances as well as we do, we're really the patient movement entity for the hospital. So we move people from point A to point B, whether it's 911 or hospital to hospital or okay. appointment to appointment. We do paratransit um, as well. So we're doing over 30,000, might be pushing 40 this year. Wow. Uh, transports and patient movements Okay. Uh, between all the modalities of care. Do you you have all the same kind or do you <laughs> ideally we would love to um unfortunately you know we're, we're a relatively new agency and we took over other agencies to become tower direct um with the health system being formed so we've branded everything the same this one happens to be a chevy 3500 on a wheeled coach okay. um but we you know we're working to standardize it and we standardized what we could which really was the equipment right so you know in terms of cost of readiness and being able to respond we wanted to make sure that whatever we could standardize we did and then from there the goal is over time and once supply chain hopefully gets a little yeah. bit better and one of the things that we had difficulty even at you know the local fire department side right. of it, was you know getting the, the ambulances yeah we placed an uh, order for an ambulance and it took us two years to get it push over three years now. yeah covid yeah. was really big hit right. on supply chain so yeah. the fact that you guys have 18 ambulances and you're actually putting things together having that in, um continuity of Equipment is going to be the key for those providers. So you're not, it may be in a little different spot, but it's the same stuff that you're looking for. Well, and because our fleet in total is 44 vehicles, which okay. um, we're fortunate enough because we're so large of all the different types of vehicles, we standardize whatever we can so we can keep parts on you know hand and have some quick turnaround time because obviously we need to keep the trucks in service. But we also are fortunate that Jose is our own mechanic in-house. So he is a godsend. He's able to keep everything running and you know PM's done on things just because with 44 vehicles, he's a very, very busy man. <laughs> Absolutely. And this is just your basically standard ambulance. This can run BLS or ALS. It can do transport versus 911. Correct, yeah. I mean, we try and do ALS is our standard of care or MICU based model. Okay. Um, you know, we have the power load stretchers in most of our vehicles um, and then as well as the monitors, but our bags are all laid out the same. Every truck has uh, the same ALS equipment where the narcotics are. We have airway cameras in every, uh, you know, set of equipment. Right. And that was, you know, credit to Bert and uh, our, clinic, our clinical team because we really did a lot of research and continual training on this just to make sure that we're improving on what we're doing. Uh, what was the, the latest was we had uh, with our CPR and we, we focus on quarterly trainings, our hands off the chest time. We're down to three seconds for our standard um, yeah. Lucas application okay. and uh, and pauses between any any intervention. That's awesome. And we have someone, you know, Jason, who does our quality, who's able to measure all those metrics and just to see the improvement with the education and the persistence, it's, it's awesome. It just kind of makes me. Okay. As I'm standing here, I see another vehicle that's very unique. Do you yeah, we walk away absolutely. Yeah, we, uh, we have another vehicle that I think you were on this call that may be the reason that this kind of came to be. And this is in conjunction with Chester County and our EMS task force. And we were fortunate enough to take ownership of it and maintain it, but it's a resource again, that's available to everyone in Chester County, as well as we've actually used it outside in other regions. And it's a mass casualty bus. Um, about seven or eight years ago, there was a large nursing home fire in Westchester. That, yeah, I was there, yeah. Yeah, it was a long, cold night. I think we were both there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, there was over 100 nursing home patients that needed to be moved in the middle of November and there was issues with temperature and, and wheelchair access and this was the, uh, the summation of that occurring. So Dude, um, that's awesome. Yeah. Brad, I thank you very much. Thanks, Doc. Mike. Good to see you, man. Yep. Thank you. So once again, this was Heroes Next Door. This was the station rigs with Tower Direct looking at their critical care truck and some of their other fleet. But pay attention because we're going to do a station rigs on this. So hit that like, hit that subscribe, hit that notification so you can see this truck in another episode. Thank you all for watching and we'll see you again next week.